Glad so much for us. Uh, hello, uh, this is Trisha Wolfrey uh, from Your Empowered Self and Ahead for Success. And today I have the lovely Gilles Palanque. Um, <laughs> did I say, I've just practiced that before the call and now I'm confused. Anyway, uh, who is based uh, in England, but actually on holiday in France is very, kindly agreed to uh, be interviewed by me today. This is my series called Let's Talk Stress. So we're gonna be talking stress with Gilles. Um, and Gilles, you're quite, uh, you've got quite, uh, quite a life, haven't you? Because you've got your own business that you run with your wife, you've got your kids, uh, you've got your home in France and here as well. And, and also you're a co-founder of the charity, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so the charity's name is? The Transforming Autism Project. Right, okay. So what made you decide to do that? Well, we have two boys and both of them are on the spectrum. Uh, they were diagnosed at a very early age. And the fact that we managed to diagnose them at a very early age and put them into a, a, um, what we call a specialist early in type of intervention. Uh, in their case, it was a... Uh, an autistic specialist preschool nursery, which had a lot of speech and language therapy and occupational therapy and so on included. Um, it had transform transformational effects on them. And although they were both diagnosed um, as fairly profoundly autistic, um, they are now two teenagers, about what, 10, 10, 11 years later, they are, they are teenagers who are thriving as what we would call high functioning or Asperger's. And, um, and because we believe in the fact that the earliest the diagnosis uh, happens with autism, the more chances you have to, to have a major influence in the child's life, which will also have an influence on the family's life. Uh, we decided to create a, a charity that effectively helps with accelerating the diagnosis process, help accelerating and, and encouraging the access to early intervention, uh, bring some new therapies to the UK that are not available at the moment, and provide guidance and support for parents at the early stages of their journey. Uh, to help them reduce anxiety, stress, confusion, despair, uh, exhaustion, and so on and so on. And that's what the charity is all about. That's absolutely fantastic. So this is um, aimed at the parents or the children or both? Um, our number one target effectively are parents, parents either of young children with autism, parents of children that could be suspected of being autistic. We can help the process of self-diagnosis, self-assessment. We even have a tool that we've developed with um, arguably the UK's number one specialist in autism, a, a pro Professor Simon Baron Cohen from the Cambridge Autism Centre. Uh, we've developed with him a, um, a tool called AcuChat, which is a 25 question questionnaires that parents can actually um, answer. And depending on their results of the questionnaire, they are given um, a, a number from one to 100 and provided the child scores above 40, they can actually download a PDF which has been recognized by the Royal um, College of General Practitioners and by uh, most pediatricians. So it actually helped accelerate the process of diagnosis. So it's a really, really useful tool, self-assessment self tool. Um, and we obviously help them by giving them proper guidance and support and help. It's very much a charity that has been created by parents for parents. So it doesn't have all the um, aseptized political correctness that you would find in the larger charities. Here we're telling people how it is. We're telling people what to do and what works and what doesn't work. And, and yeah. I think people really appreciate that. Keeping it real. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm so impressed by the self-assessment tool because I, I, I have been asked in my, my career if there's such a thing. And what I've done is I've referred them to somebody who does this. But if there's something online that's easy, I would love to be able to share it with people if that's appropriate. There are, there are quite a few different questionnaires which are all depending on age groups. So the one that we have put together alongside um, Professor Simon Baron Cohen is, is actually targeting children before the age of three. But the Autism Center from Cambridge has created one for girls, created ones from the age of three to seven, created one for teenagers. So there's quite a few different self-assessment questionnaires available. And um, I can obviously give you the link to the, to the, to, to the one we've put together. Yeah. Uh, the other ones, I'll try my best to get you the link, but they are linked to the Autism Center from Cambridge University. Okay, that, that would be really helpful because I'm sure there are some people that are kind of wondering if it's applicable to them or not. And that would be, that would really help them 
um, come to some realization for themselves. Well, it, for a start, it's, it's, it's great for parents to be able to, you know, get to term and understand exactly what's happening with their child. The second thing is um, the average process of diagnosis in the UK can be anything from two to three years on average. Wow. Um, once you have in your hands a document that is recognized by the Royal uh, College of General Practitioners, suddenly you're talking about three months on average for the diagnosis. So the, 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 yeah. and the speed can be very, you know, that speed is element is, uh, is hugely important because yeah. the amount of, of, of uh, intervention, the amount of therapies, the amount of input you can put in that child during those two to three years that you would have missed out. Yes. especially at an early age can be absolutely huge for the yeah. rest of their life so transformational using using a word we, word it, trans we are not transforming autism in the fact that you know autism a, a child with autism will always be autistic what yeah. we do is transform their chances and their prospect for life yeah. and at the same time we transform the life of their parents as well because you know um the child's condition will always have such an impact on the parents on, yeah. the, on, on the siblings on the rest of the family and if we can actually help through simple things like accelerating the, pro the process of diagnosis and, and assessment, um, then we can help enormously the family long term. Yeah, that, that's really fantastic. So for your sons, what, what are the interventions, uh, just one or two, that you found most helpful, if it's appropriate to share? Uh, absolutely. Well, for a start, getting straight away, I mean, one, of, one was diagnosed at the age of two, the other one, 18 months. You know, when you think that the average age of diagnosis in the UK is around sort of five years and eight months for a boy and seven years and eight months for a girl, ours were considered as very early on. And, and it, it was really, really good to be able to put them straight away into speech and language therapy, um, something called TEACH, uh, T-E-A-C-H-H, -H, which is a therapy that is all based on uh, social interaction, social communication, especially through play, um, that help them effectively reduce their anxiety in regards to social interaction, social interaction, etc. You know, I'm not saying that it reprograms their blueprint, but pretty much at an early stage, it helped them realize that there's no need to have that sort of additional anxiety linked to communicating and interacting with others. Um, and that is that is key because if at an age of two or three years old, you can almost reprogram their mind on the fact that actually talking to other people or engaging with other people is not something that should have a negative connotation or fear attached to it but on the contrary something that could be enjoyable and pleasurable then it, it changes already a massive part of autism because autism as you may know is you know they call it the triad of impairment i hate this particular terminology but the way they diagnose it is when you have um impairment in, in at least three major areas together, one being social interaction, social communication, sensory issues. And if you can already knock off social communication and social interaction, then already the, 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 the I would say the, the, the symptoms or the, the, the visible traits of autism will be massively reduced. Yeah, that's and then fantastic. You have a child which which is much more sociable, much more communicative, can understand uh, a, a lot more how to how to live in society, and in long term could be a child which will be able to handle a job, handle a, a family. You know, we're talking the the work you do with a child at two or three years old could actually have an impact for the next 70, 80 years of his life. You see, Absolutely. I mean, that's 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 key. Absolutely key, and we believe greatly into into helping parents um, in in down, down that road. Mm. Excellent. So, Gilles, tell me, what are the kind of things that stress you out on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I have to say that I've actually learned how to manage my stress. Because Excellent. <laughs> if, you had, if you had done this exact interview, I would say around sort of 2008, when we had just had the second diagnosis, in this, in, basically most boys were diagnosed pretty much within the same year, um, at a time where my previous business had just been hit extremely badly by recession at the time when, because of that, we had put ourselves into a 70,000 pound debt. We had been made homeless. We didn't know where we were going to live next. We, had abs we were in absolute turmoil. I would not have had the same sort of interview that I'm going to have today. But I would say that the number one thing that has helped me is personal development, is reading books, is, 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 is almost like understanding what's important and what's not important and letting yeah. go of what's not important is really yeah. finding yeah. a way where my values and my priorities are aligned 
it's i think a key part of life is when you manage to find alignment when everything starts to align itself suddenly your level of stress goes way down and um and also constantly reminding yourself you know is what's happening right now to me is going to be important in the year's time if the question is not is not yes then you know it's not that important and you know what it's you know somebody cutting you on the on the on the traffic lane some people go completely mental and, and and have road rage me nowadays i'm like well you know if that's what you want this has how you want to live your life fine but that's that's not going to affect my day today so i'm i'm going down to a i won't say a spiritual level as such but really calming myself down on a, on a daily basis by by reminding myself of what's important what's not important um what is is it going to affect my life? Is it going to affect my values? Is it going to affect the alignment that I've now found in my life? And if it, if the answer is is no, then I have absolutely no reasons to be stressed. Yeah. Uh, now that doesn't mean that every single day I don't have a you know a moment when suddenly um, a customer has an issue with the pro with, with the product, and all of a sudden you have to to sort out the the the, the, the situation or or the, or the children obviously you know still being um, who they are. We end up having moments of meltdowns or, or, or issue with sensitivities or, mm. or or all these sort of things but again it's it's a question of understand put everything in relation you know relate really re sorry that's the french side of me uh, really really oh, re relative relative putting everything in <laughs> relative in perspective Perfect. so yeah so that will it matter in a year from now is a great perspective question because we kind of see just what's in front of us without yeah. seeing how it how it lines up with everything else right. and this this idea of being aligned to your purpose and your values yes. again it helps other things to just fall away they're not important and Absolutely. you know of course if we're tired and we're hungry we're going to get more stressed than at time when we're not tired and hungry and so on but it just means you can let go of things much much more easily when you have that purpose and mission and values and so on i think something else which is quite important uh, or, or hugely important is is having a sense of, of gratitude and understanding what yeah. what your you know at the end of the day i feel blessed every single day yes we've had a period of our life where i again at the time it was just like oh my god what's happening to us but another thing that that my wife and i and i know you know my wife very well um on our fridge during that period of time we had a quote written and the quote was saying life is 10 percent what happens to you and 90 percent how you react to it yeah i love that quote um yeah. but people see how you react to it as the reality of the situation but it's not it's a perspective of the situation yeah. so it sounds as though what happened when you were in that phase is uh, you know that 2008 is you just went into action mode so all of this is going on what do i do about it and you know when you start taking action on your situation that can be very helpful as well if it's this it's a kind of situation where you can take action because sometimes it just is what it is mm -hmm. uh you know so i i use that phrase a lot sometimes you know we can't change uh but we can change our reaction to it okay Absolutely. you know for us it was a question of diving fully into understanding our children learning as much as we possibly could to help them get you know the, the very best out of where they were in terms of of putting in place the right environment for them the right education for them the right um making sure that the home was the, the, the safest and the best place for them to grow uh, finding things that they really enjoyed doing so we could actually help them develop as children uh, without without focusing on the autism uh, so we we basically did all this and and at the same time was finding solutions to fall back on our feet financially and and and, and business wise which we did and you know i know a lot of people when they when they know me they 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 think they think that I'm, I'm pretty chilled and so on but for a long period of time the way i would um it was almost like the iceberg or, or more like the anal analogy of the of the duck where on the outside of the surface you know it looks pretty cool but underneath the legs are going like crazy and, and that was us for a few years now we are more in a we're more like the swan yeah <laughs> yeah very peaceful uh, <laughs> that feels much better actually by the way uh, it would do so so tell me what book would you like to recommend uh, our viewers that's helped you particularly um 
Well, one of the things that helped me enormously in regards to finding my purpose, finding my alignment, finding my, my, um, my direction in life uh, was, um, what was it, about five, five six years ago, I, dis I discovered a concept called Ikigai, mm -hmm. uh, the concept of the Japanese concept, which is effectively the concept of finding your life's purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, you won't be surprised if uh, what was it four years ago, five years ago, I started to really dive into it. Um, I had just reached 40. I had just had had a life threatening, uh, bike accident where for a couple of seconds, I thought I was going to die. And that's changed again, the perspective on my life and putting everything back into, you know, it's not that important. If I'm not going to die, it's not that important. Um, and within, a few months of really digging into sort of soul searching introspection trying to really identify what it is that i wanted to do with my life you know I, i've i've always believed that if i've been put on this planet it's for a reason it's for a good reason it's not just to you know work for 45 years and then retire and do nothing it's it's really for for a, a purpose and um and the charity came out of it. I think the charity was very much the one thing that I had been looking for. Um, since then, I've also developed a business which could, which aligns perfectly with the charity, with the boys, with everything. Um, but basically, the charity was the one moment when everything started to feel like my life had a goal, my life had a purpose, my life. You know, I knew where I was going, I knew what I wanted to achieve. And again, that's that sense that that brings sense of gratitude, that brings sense of fulfillment that brings a sense of peace of mind i'm going to bed in the evening thinking i'm doing things for everyone and it's good and it's it's positive and i'm making an impact um and and to an extent i'm change, i'm helping changing people's lives for the better and you know if you do that every single day of your life you know you can sleep very nicely and all of a sudden a lot of things like i said if somebody cut you off on the motorway it's really not that much of a problem anymore exactly so i actually you introduced me to icky guy um because you did a presentation on it didn't you and I, I absolutely love it so i use it a lot with my clients now and what i've noticed is because uh, you've got a really strong purpose and mission i've got a strong purpose and mission but some people they don't and they think it has to be something that's going to change the world it can it can be very very small like to create a happy family absolutely. or you know it, whatever resonates with that individual so it doesn't have to be profound nope. and, it, and it can be it's whatever suits the person I think again, the, the, the word that is possibly missing that people don't realize, and I've used it several times already, and you have as well, is alignment. Yeah. I think what you need to find is something that will feel absolutely 100% right with your values, yeah. with, with the way you live your life, with what, you know, Ikigai is effectively finding something that makes both what you love, what you're good at, what, what should be your profession, what, could you, what you could be paid for, and what you believe is important to the world. And that, again, could be about, um, you know, helping your local rugby team, you know, or it could be raising a beautiful family, or it could be creating a charity, or it could be, um, you know, I don't know, um, going and save the children in Africa. I don't know what, it's, what, what, real, what will actually make you feel 100% fulfilled inside yourself. But that, once you find it, that's your ikigai and that's what you should be striving to do for the rest of your life. Um, there is, um, I think it was Michael Neal that talked about this, there's three levels of happiness. One is pleasure, where you do things that give you pleasure, chocolate and ice cream for me. <laughs> <laughs> Two is satisfaction or achievement and that's where you feel you've done something well. So you only really get that when you move outside of your comfort zone. And the third one, but but it's a lot better than, than uh, the pleasure, which, you know, is, Pleasure is good, of course we all want pleasure. And then the third one is fulfillment, and, and yeah. that's what we're talking about here. But a lot of people, they don't hit the other two, so they're constantly looking for pleasure everywhere, uh, which is not a problem so much, but it's not fulfilling, so they feel a little bit empty. So I made a joke about chocolate and ice cream, which is, seriously, I do, I do like the chocolate and my ice cream. <laughs> but yeah. because, because I have a sense of achievement and I, I have a sense of fulfillment. I don't need so much of that as I might need if I don't have those things. So it's important to have all levels of happiness in your life, I think. Yeah. I think you mentioned something which is very key, and that's the word comfort zone. What did I say? <laughs> comfort zone. You comfort know, you zone, yeah. Okay. yeah. Very often people get stressed because their comfort zone is being challenged. Yeah. Now, 
in our case, I think 12 years ago, our comfort zone got stretched so much, a little bit like a balloon. So comfort zone works a little bit like a balloon. You know, at the beginning, when you start to blow into a balloon for the first time, it's really hard to stretch it. But then once you've actually stretched it many times, it becomes easy to come out of it or to actually stretch it further. Mm. And, and 2012 for us, it was like a hot air balloon. <laughs> it went into boom, massive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So nowadays, again, there's not, we, we are quite easily ha happy to push ourselves further and, to, and to, to get out of the comfort zone and to go into the learning zone and to go into the challenging zone and to go into, you know, um, I was mentioning to you prior to, um, to the call, but, I take my kids to do some rock, rock, rock diving and, and it's absolutely beautiful to see them, you know, when last year jumping a rock, which was maybe three meters high, was putting fear in their eyes, but then they did it and now they're going to the next level and then the next level, they, they're really scared, but then they do it again and every single time start to see them challenging themselves. You know, but I've got two boys which are absolutely uh, fascinated by roller coasters. Roller coasters is their way of, Again, finding satisfaction and finding <laughs> fulfillment. Um, why? Because it it helped them push their limit one bit at a time, further and further and further. And yeah. for me, the father, to see them grow and to see them literally terrified but pushing themselves. Yeah. And then maybe going into the queue and then bottling it. And that's fine. We allowed for them to bottle it, bottle it because we know that they're gonna come back. And the next time they go in the queue. With yeah. it, but then the moment when they do it and the elation when they come out of it, yeah. you know, that just itself is a symbol of what, you know, dealing with your comfort zone is about. Yeah. And I know that we are, we have two boys growing right now, which will not have that fear of pushing themselves through their life. And that alone is something that I'm so proud to have given to my children. Um, I would highly recommend people you know, to challenge themselves a, a lot more. Because if you challenge yourself more, the chances are is all the things that felt really important and stressful will no longer feel so important mm. and stressful. Mm. So that's a really good point you were making. Yeah, so the, the comfort zone is not a place of comfort. It's a, a, a place of perceived safety, but also it makes your world incredibly small because we get comfortable with less and less and less. Mm -hmm. So that stretching and that growth is the only way of achieving achieve a sense of achievement okay. and satisfaction and the only way that you can get fulfillment but for some it's um so it's kind of working on that anxiety for people isn't it yeah okay. the, another, another book you were mentioning oh, that yes. book. the first book that i would like to mention i took it with me today um obviously is ikigai yeah. funny enough i found this book about three or four days uh, four years after having discovered the concept so for a long period of time i did it by researching the internet and and, and looking into it myself but uh, I think a couple of years ago, Hector Garcia and Frances Mirales wrote a really, really good book on, on Ikigai, and I highly recommend it. Another book I would recommend, and I apologize, there's going to be a swear word in it, but it's basically, it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Uh, <laughs> I've read it too. <laughs> it's by Mark Manson. It's a big yeah. orange book. Um, Again, you don't even need to read the whole book. Just read the first two or three chapters. That's going to be perfectly enough for you to just get yourself into the idea of what it means. But, you know, again, this is all about putting things in relation. This is all about um, understanding what's important, what's, what's not so important, and, and, and effectively learning how to let go of the non-important things and, yeah. and, um, and free yourself, free your mind, free your, free your stress. Uh, yeah. from, from, from what's not necessary to, um, to, to get stressed about. And uh, that's a really good one to, um, to uh, I, I really enjoyed reading this book actually. Yeah, the, there's a paragraph in there that is laugh out loud. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good, not for everyone, but it's, it's a good book. <laughs> yeah, I apologize, I swore on your- No, other... don't worry. You know, I never used to swear. And then one day, I don't know why, but I did. And I thought, oh, this feels quite good actually. There is a, there is a kind of, healing quality to swearing oh, sometimes something that we um something that i would recommend people to do as well um it, because we're all human okay and even even us at this stage right now we um there are still moments when whew, you know things start to get quite overwhelming last day of the month when things are going crazy business-wise so there is something we we call it a pity party a okay? pity party a pity P -I a pity party a pity all right party. Yeah, as your French accent. Sorry. <laughs> a pity <Yeah>. party. <laughs> a pity party. And a pity party is basically when you start to really feel overwhelmed and maybe stressed, allow yourself five minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. go to your bedroom mm -hmm. and
and you have a pillow fight with yourself or whatever it is, you know, mm. let it go, let it burst out. You're allowed. It's fine. We all, you know, if you need to cry, you cry. If you need to bash your pillow against the bed, bash your pillow against the bed. Five minutes. You give yourself five minutes and that's it. Yeah. And, and then pity party. Pity party is good. There's been times where, you know, we were, the boys were challenging us and the business was going crazy and things were really like, oh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, hold on, Miss Claire, we, 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 we talk to each other and we say, okay, pity party. And then we disappear for five minutes and we yeah. come back. Yeah. Yeah. So much better. Um, so Scheduled and limited time is perfect. If you have a punching bag or if you have something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, my, 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 uh, my, my way to actually evacuate sort of the stress is, is through sports, through doing a lot of, um, of activities out there. Um, and you know, everybody's going to have their own ways, but, um, yeah. if you really need to just have a big outburst of, of, of stress, don't do it on, on other people. Don't do it with other people. Just do it by yourself somewhere safe. And then just basically you're allowed five minutes. Everybody's allowed five minutes of pity party. Yeah. Gilles, this has been absolutely fascinating, really enjoyable. Uh, thank you so much indeed. I shall put, uh, the, uh, the link to your organization and if you can send me right, whatever right. self-assessment that would be great and i wish you a great break in france all right thank you so much and right. i will see you when i come back that thank you lovely. so much take care take care bye-bye